from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debates from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in the commentary box in the Media Centre at Lord's Cricket Ground in St John's Wood, North London. It's the venue for the second men's Ashes test. It's a little overcast. I look across to the Victorian Pavilion, but it is Red for Ruth Day here, which is for the Ruth Strauss Foundation. I am decked out in a completely bright red suit, feel a bit like a ringmaster in a big top, but it's all in aid of raising awareness of rare lung cancers. Sadly, Andrew Strauss, the former England captain, his wife Ruth passed away from a very rare form of lung cancer several years ago. And so this foundation is raising awareness for that and also helping uh, bereaved young children as well. So there'll be lots of red around Lords, and that might just brighten things up a little bit because it felt a little bit flat here on day one of this uh, men's ashes test match where England need to bounce back from 1-0 down. Hello there, it's Jim Maxwell sitting alongside Ali up in the media centre. And uh, I'm not wearing red, but there's a bit of red on my face, I think, from all the sun in the UK in the last couple of weeks up until the start of this match. But I'm, I'm sure it'll be sunny again. And it certainly has been for Australia. A very prosperous opening day, despite the fact uh, they were sent in to bat the Australian batsmen. Uh, they they found a way, didn't they? So um, by the time you hear all this, who knows where the game is going? But I think at the moment, red's probably a good colour for England. Well, I don't know about red ball in England right now because they, I think, are staring at 2 0 a couple of days from now. But we'll see. I'm Charu Sharma for Akashwani. I'm uh, glad to be home again in Bangalore. Or, of course, not too much cricket going on right now in India. But uh, they are preparing for a tour to the West Indies. However, I've had some time, luckily, to be watching a bit of the Ashes. And I must confess, Australia are just too good in terms of their men cricketers and, of course, they're women as well. So, Alison, you can wear all the red you want, but red ball's not quite favouring England at this point in time. We'll see how this match goes. No, it has been all Australia, hasn't it? And to say that the Aussie batters seem pretty dialed in on day one of this match in what should have been much trickier conditions than it turned out to be. The England bowlers didn't really quite capitalise on what was put in front of them. The pitch probably, Jim, just didn't really offer as much pace as they thought as well. But, yeah, it's a couple of batters very dialed in. Very. Steve Smith back in the zone. Danger for England when he's switched on like that because uh, he has an insatiable appetite, as we yes, know. he does. Well, we'll wait and see how this match unfolds. We will come back to the talk Ashes very shortly <clears> because, <throat> as Cherry mentioned, the women's test concluded in the last week and they're getting into the white ball part of their multi-format series. But it's been a very sobering week for cricket in England and Wales because a landmark review into the game has said that racism, sexism, classism and elitism are widespread spread in English and Welsh cricket. Now, this report was compiled by the Independent Commission for Equity in Cricket, ICEC, and it comes at the end of a two-year investigation. More than 4,000 people responded to an online questionnaire and fact-finding mission, and more than 150 people gave written evidence of their lived experiences in the game, at whatever level and in whatever capacity that might have been across all levels, from grassroots, recreational and upwards. More than half of those who responded said they'd faced discrimination. For people with Pakistani and Bangladeshi heritage, that figure went up to 87%. The report did praise the ECB for being brave enough to open itself to independent scrutiny. But what of the reaction of the ECB? Their chief executive is Richard Thompson, and he's been speaking to the BBC's sports editor, Dan Rowan. Well, I think the first thing I need to do, Dan, is to apologise, and that's the first recommendation that the report made. Uh, so I think to, to those individuals that have been discriminated against, that have been excluded, um, all of those individuals, the game, the ECB, the game as a whole, owes them a real genuine apology, a heartfelt apology as to the fact that this should be a game for all. And unfortunately, this report identifies with the fact that it has not been a game for all. So it is a damning report, but I think given the recent case of Azim Rafiq here in the UK and stories that have been brought to light in the last few years, it, it hasn't come as a surprise. I suppose, Jim and Charu, to, to open it up to both of you, I mean, the report is called Holding Up a Mirror to Cricket. So that mirror has been held up to cricket in England and Wales. And 
I wonder if it was held up also to Australia and India, other countries. To what extent do you think you would find similar stories of discrimination or exclusion, Jim, of certain groups? I don't think you'll find it to the same degree in Australia. I, I always like to think uh, as Australia is a pretty strong multiracial society and f- <laughs> dare I say it, more egalitarian than perhaps the UK in that regard. And it's the strength of club cricket that holds the game together. I mean, I know from my experience at the club that I'm involved in, we embrace everybody. And I like to think that's generally the case. I haven't heard a lot of noise in this regard, other than perhaps in the Indigenous environment, where there's clearly a uh, an agenda with Cricket Australia to embrace Indigenous uh, Australians and get them playing cricket because that's been one of the problems historically that most Indigenous athletes in Australia uh, go for high impact and fast moving sports rather than uh, the relative um, <clears throat> tranquility of a game of cricket I suppose but I'd like to think We're in a wholesome position in Australia, but I can't speak for everyone. Um, And I'm sure someone will be holding that mirror up, as you say, and looking at it uh, as Cricket Australia uh, would be be saying to us now if they were asked that question. Charu in India? Yeah, well, I think Jim mentions an important aspect of... of, uh, I'm not authorised to speak for everybody, but uh, an honest opinion in terms of holding a mirror. Uh, In India, of course, there's, there's a very high degree of democracy... Uh, of the sport at this point of time now. It began as a very elite sport, but it has now become very accessible to just about everybody. So I don't think there can be a legitimate claim of not being allowed to pursue your cricket dreams. Of course, there is a financial angle where if one is an, in an economically weaker section, then obviously the chances are or the facilities are, are reduced. And uh, the board or those involved in the game can't really solve for everything. But to pick up some other words, in terms of sexism, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think the women now are rising grandly in India. They're doing really well. Uh, the youngsters are being allowed to pursue the game, uh, young women, that is. So uh, if in the past uh, India could have been accused of not allowing enough women to pursue sport, or cricket in particular, I think that's changed hugely. Uh, classism uh, is, a, you know, I mean, there, there, are, is, there are classes in every society, and so are there in India. But once again, I allude to that democracy where everybody now has access to the game. But I do think at the end of it all, the ECB, as you mentioned earlier in the report, was truly brave to conduct this kind of uh, a study. And uh, I, I hope that in England, now that we've discovered the percentages of those who feel upset, uh, something is done about it. Chair, sitting here at, at Lords, and you know, you only have to think back. It was 25 years ago that women weren't even allowed in the in the pavilion Gosh. at Lords. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether 25 years is a short space of time for so much to have changed, or whether it should have happened much quicker than that. But it's a <laughs> certain a time span, isn't it? Yeah, I think things are changing a lot quicker than ever before. If that makes any sense. So 25 years might mean a lot, but I'm sure the changes in the last four or five years, you even had an MCC president being a lady, correct? So I think change, things are are changing very rapidly now and, and all for the better. Uh, and I do hope that this 87% really belongs to the, the past, as it were. And if you would do another survey saying what happened in the last five years, you might find that the percentage is a lot less because there is a lot more awareness now. And of course, it, it's led from the top almost always. So even the Stoke says he's deeply sorry. I wish he were genuinely sorry would be the next step. And then of course, As a leader, for him to be seen to be doing things and going to various communities and exciting them and bringing them into the game, just more visible contact with uh, those who feel aggrieved, I think will will make a very big difference. Not just Tim, of course, he's the leader of the team now, but even the ECB in terms of its its, uh, senior functionaries going out there and just mingling with the rest. And I think even those optics make a difference, Alison. Well, let's turn to matters on the pitch then and get talking about the Ashes because the second men's test has only just started here at But in the women's, Australia demonstrated exactly why they're world champions against England with victory by 89 runs in the test match at Nottingham. Thanks to Ash Gardner, who starred with eight for 66 and she took 12 wickets in the match overall. Jim, just how impressed were you with Gardner's performance? Well, it was outstanding. And um, it, it also vindicated the idea of five days for a women's test because um just the nature of of the women's game in in, in part and also uh, abetted by the pitch, Uh, you you find that 
it, it really needs a bit of wear and tear in the surface for someone to be able to involve themselves in the way Gardner did. Uh, it, it is a struggle on a lot of surfaces for the pace or medium fast bowlers to do what the spinners can do and what Gardner did in that match with, with 12 wickets. It was a, a very impressive performance. I can still see that delivery that got Heather Knight out LBW uh, and that kind of summed up what occurs in a five-day game. So uh, after two and a half, three days, you thought, well, this is going to be a bit of a boring draw, isn't it, the way it's going? But Australia had a little bit of momentum and um, Alyssa Healy's batting in their second innings at a point where they may not have had quite enough. It just tipped it over, I think. So, um, And the old story, well, if you bat first, you normally control the game. Um <laughs> Which is not a lesson that everyone is adhering to at the moment. No. Charu, when you look at Gardner, she attracted the second highest bid in the inaugural WPL, the Women's Premier League in India. And she's lived up to her billing because, I mean, that price tag is likely to get a mention every time she plays a match now. <laughs> well, white ball, red ball, there's a big difference. But I, I think she got most of that money because she is a genuine all-rounder. So, you know, there, it was the runs that uh, that people were... Uh, paying the money for not so much her off spin, if you if you if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, I think the pitch was doing some very funny things on the fifth day, <laughs> and 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 I felt for the English batsman because the ball was just all over the place. You mentioned that one ball to Heather Knight, but many others were uh, either turning hugely or not turning at all. Uh, now you can put that to the guile of Gardner, but I, I I wonder if she meant to turn it like three feet or whatever it was. Uh, I, I must quickly also mention, because I got a fair amount of time at home to be watching the match, that I was very impressed with the double. Uh, Tammy Beaumont was yeah. just fabulous and, and, and kept you in the hunt for so long. Um, England's highest ever score. So all of that went really well for England till they capitulated towards the end because, well, the pitch didn't help them. And, of course, Jim mentioned a few extra runs, uh, quite a few extra runs in the end in the second innings for Australia. I think England were just a little loose there saying, well, we did so well in the first innings and surely we can get another 300 or so, not in the fourth. You know, so they have to learn about the fifth day uh, a little more. Yet, a very absorbing test. And I, I wish you luck, Alison, because now there are, what, 12 points on the match, four given away. So plenty of pressure. And hope you can do better in white ball cricket because there is no fifth day, is there? Now, the Ashes might have got people talking down under, but uh, something that left many Australians in tears recently, in a good way, that is, the hit children's cartoon show Bluey recently featured an episode called Cricket. The show is about a Queensland family of dogs named after the main character, who's a blue healer, and it's a huge hit. It's as popular with parents as it is with their children. It smashed Australian viewing records, won multiple awards, and can be viewed in more than 60 countries, including the United States, the UK, and in China. Now, it's this third season of the show where this one particular episode has really resonated with cricket fans. And I'm even more delighted that we can welcome the Bluey creator, Joe Brum, to Stumped. Joe, welcome to the programme. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ali. Nice to be here. Great to have you on. And first of all, I've just got to ask simply, why cricket and why only now for an Aussie programme? You know, it was just such a part of growing up. Um, cricket, it was always, it was just always there, you know, both both watching on TV and playing it in the yard and in in at the beach and about 20 years ago I backpacked around India for like six seven months and and it was you know just it was right during the the one day world cup like when we had you know it was Warney and maybe Hayden like just a, when we won it and so cricket was just even more kind of alive than than it usually is you know and and we play cricket everywhere I remember playing on the Andaman Islands I organized this big game against the locals there and we, you know, my team was basically like myself, uh, I think one Brit who could bowl and then all these Irish backpackers who, who basically <laughs> treated it like a hurling bat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I never forget going to Calaba in Mumbai and going to this set of four or five ovals in, in a row that I think Sachin Tendulkar cut his teeth at. And I remember joining in on a game and there were probably... There are four ovals, but there there seem to be at least twenty games all happening simultaneously. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a great I remember place. I was, I was fielding in the slips in this one game, but there was an outfielder for this game right next to me, and it all just sort of worked. <laughs> you know, we didn't touch that ball. It, it's hard not to come away from an experience like that without a, a greater appreciation of how much the, what the game means 
to people, you know. Um, so many memories of that trip are, are cricket related. Um, yeah, that no, it was fantastic. So kind of cricket sport being a code for life and, and like so many messages come through Bluey. Is that what then particularly attracted you? There was a, a message you could use cricket to be the medium for? Yeah, I think it's, you know, like the little the little character in it, Rusty, who's the star of it, who's, who's obsessed with cricket and it's just his thing. It's, it, you know, the, the story really is about cricket is his connection to his family and particularly his dad who who is away a lot and and it's just it's sort of how it was in in my life you know cricket you played a different game of cricket depending on who you're playing with you played a different game with your parents at the beach you know you it would be more fun right you'd be stealing stumps and you'd be chasing them or you're pretending you can't find the ball you know so to draw them out for another run whereas it would be a different game with your mates so that I just thought a lot about that the game does it, it has a different you play it differently, depending, you know, depending on who you're with. It's Jim Maxwell alongside Ali here at um, the home of cricket. Uh, Joe, just going on about the um, reception, the reaction that Blue has received. Um, I noticed that 563,000 households tuned into the episode, which was uh, more than the cricket uh, world test championship final between Australia and India. So that's a huge plus, is it not? I don't know how I feel about that, but um, <laughs> yeah, it went, went down well. There was a lot of pressure. Like, you know, Australians, as you know, we take cricket pretty seriously. So we we put a lot of work into making sure it looked like a game of cricket and we we did, you know, we did that relationship justice. But is it right you, you come up with the storylines, Joe, sort of based on your own family experience? Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I write all the episodes and a lot of them are just – you know, based on my my life, my kids and my nieces and my friends' kids. So cricket was 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 no exception. It was probably a little bit more based on my life and my friends' life. But I think everyone's got that one kid, one or two kids in their life they grew up with, those mates who were just really good at cricket or rugby league or whatever. And and I drew a lot on them, you know, just those mates who are just really good at it. And and then, you know, you read a lot about successful, you know, test cricketers and and a lot of them were just these kids who were just who just lived and breathed it. So yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And it was so much fun just doing all the real all the colloquial stuff, six and out and you know, um the I don't know, it was just I had a lot of fun. It was very technically challenging yet, but um it was so much fun. Has the reaction to this particular episode surprised you in any way? Have you done other episodes which have really sort of, you know, hit hit the mark in this in this cultural sense? Oh, look, this one, I always knew this was going to be a special app. You know, I have to watch these things a lot of times in the process of making them. And and I know when I've got a good one because I I I just, it would still kind of make me feel something, you know, the last... 30 seconds of this one, even on my 10th watch. And so I usually have a suspicion that it will do well, but I I, I didn't think it was going to go down this well. Like I, I was actually, I flew to France for an animation festival the day after it aired. So I was sort of getting all this stuff on my phone, you know, in the mornings. But it, yeah, it really, it was so satisfying just that, that the Australian, you know, audience took it took it in and accepted it. Yeah, and it is the last 30 seconds, which is key for anyone who hasn't watched it yet. No spoilers, but it's only seven minutes long. The last 30 seconds is gold. Joe, thank you so much for being with us on Stumped. And yeah, good luck with taking Bluey to even greater heights. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Yeah, my pleasure. Go Australia. <laughs> Go the Aussies. That is Joe Blum. That's it. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Joe Brum, the creator of Bluey with us. Well, that's all we've got time for on Stumped. So I say thank you to Jim Maxwell and to Charis Sharma and to all of you. And we'll see you again same time next week. Bye-bye.